Hi. Can you hear me? I can certainly hear you. Okay. Um, I think they're just coming back, so yeah, just give them uh, another minute or two at least. Okay. Um, that microphone isn't working very well, by the way. I, I cannot hear CV. Uh, that may be me. Is it better like this? Mm. That's really. It's, very, it's very quiet, or what's the problem exactly? Now, now I can hear you. Can or you cannot? Uh, oh, let me quick. I will try another microphone. Now I cannot. Okay, we change the volume. Is this better? Yes, much better. Okay, perfect. Okay, I think that most people are back, so you can start, Eric, uh, when you can. Oh, oh, okay, you tell me that I can start now. Sorry, I, I can't hear you very well. Okay, so, so I just said that most people are back, so you can start whenever. Ah, okay, okay. Well, let's start. <clears throat> So in my previous lecture, we studied um, some aspects of gauge double field theory. We, we try to perform this four step um, construction. We start defining an extended double geometry. This was our first step to construct a geometry. Sorry, I need to draw over here. Our uh, extended double geometry was defined on a two-dimensional 2D plus N dimensional space, space. This, this is not exactly a manifold. This is just a two-dimensional 2D plus N dimensional space. Uh, it's an extension of double field theory. Um, we managed to construct generalized notions of symmetries over this space let me raise this because it's I don't like it. But we could define uh, generalized diffeomorphisms. These diffeomorphisms were um, contain a modification, it contain a structure constant. This is a modification to the double field theory formulation, and we um, define double Lorentz transformations. And these double Lorentz transformations. Um, require a gauge fixing. So we start analyzing the generalized symmetries. Then we analyze the fundamental fields, in this case, for gauge double field theory or for heterotic double field theory. Our fundamental fields were a generalized frame. We had this object, a generalized frame. This object is a generalization of a field line. It's a kind of double field line in, in, in gauge double field theory. This object depends on uh, the ordinary field line, a B field, and a non abelian gauge field. We parameterize this object, and this object contains all this uh, information, all, all, all these fields. And we also have a dilaton over here generalized dilaton. And in some sense, this, this object depends on the determinant of the field line and depends on the usual dilaton. So in some sense, 
the fundamental fields in gauge double field theory are exactly the same as the fields in, in double field theory, but our, our generalized metric or our generalized frame depends on this new um, non-abelian gauge vector, this, this gauge vector over here. Depends on this vector. So if we if we take a this gauge vector to zero, then we recover the ordinary double field theory. And we also studied the action from gauge double field theory. This action uh, was already introduced by Gianluca because the action is the same. The action of gauge double field theory is the same same action of double field theory. We can write this action of gauge double field theory as uh, an integration over 2D plus n dimensions, x. And we have a measure over here related to the dilaton. And then we have a generalized rich scalar. This generalized rich scalar depends on the generalized frame and depends on the generalized dilaton through generalized fluxes. We introduce general, generalized fluxes. And with this generalized fluxes, uh, we we could construct this uh, scalar, this generalized rich scalar. Um, an important point here is that the, this rich scalar came from a generalized Riemann tensor, but that Riemann tensor is not fully determined. We can construct a, a notion of, of connection in double field theory, but the connection is not determined uh, asking, for example, compatibility with the generalized metric, the generalized frame, and the generalized dilaton. We do not have enough compatibility conditions in order to, to construct a, a Riemann tensor, a fully determined Riemann tensor. But the Ricci tensor, the generalized Ricci tensor, and the generalized Ricci scalar are well defined, are completely um, de determined. They, they depend, this Ricci scalar, for example, depends on the generalized frame and the generalized dilaton. This, this was our, our studies related to gauge double field theory. We had this, this kind of formalism. And in the last lecture, we, we finish introducing a generalized notion of a Green Schwartz mechanism at the DFT level. And this kind of mechanism, this, this, this mechanism over here, this green short mechanism is a two derivative double Lorentz deformation of the generalized frame field. So in, in this lecture, we first, um, we are going to, I am going to show you first a, a first proposal, a kind of ansatz or a proposal, a natural proposal to, to construct a generalized green short mechanism. And then we are going to explore a systematic procedure to construct these things. Um, sorry, I am going to write here. This systematic procedure is the generalized version of the right identification. So let me write in this way, identification. Using this generalized version of the right identification, we are uh, able to construct the generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism the generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism plus a four derivative action. This is the idea for today. We are going to, to analyze a generalized version of the row identification. And using this identification, we will be able to construct both the generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism and the four derivative action. So this is the idea for today. Sorry, this must be a three. Our goal now is to deform, uh, as I was saying, the transformation of the generalized frame in order to construct a higher derivative double field theory. We want a, this a higher derivative double field theory. And we, are, and we are going to work in the ODD case. We are, we are turning off the gauge part. We are not working with the ODD plus N. We just work with this object over here with no calligraphics in the in the index, the indices, sorry. Um, we can construct a higher derivative double field theory. And then if we if you want, uh, you can uh, perform this promotion from ODD to ODD plus N. 
But for now, we are focused on the on the gravitational part. We are not focused on the young mix terms. We are going to construct a generalized green schwartz mechanism for ordinary DFT, at least uh, uh, in the beginning. So the idea of this generalized green schwartz mechanism, this generalized green schwartz mechanism, is related to a two derivative deformation of the Lorentz transformation of the generalized frame. These are the two projections of the generalized frame. In principle, these uh, green schwartz mechanisms could be different. In some sense, these, these frames um, are a, a bit different because they have different projections. Recall that these projections are related to projectors that can be constructed using the invariant matrix of double field theory. This is the, the, first term, the first term over here, this term over here, is a covariant transformation considering double Lorentz transformation. This is the covariant part. This is covariant. This is the covariant part. And this over here, we want this to be the generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism. So the natural proposal the natural proposal, we are not going to obtain first this kind of transformations from first principles. We are trying to, to impose some ansatz, some ansatz in order to construct this generalized green schwartz mechanism. A natural proposal is to consider this kind of contributions as a T1. Why? Because this component, this projection of the generalized fluxes is related to the spin connection with torsion. We studied this, um, this parametrization in the previous lecture. So this kind of proposal is very natural since we have the derivative of the parameter over here. We have the derivative of the parameter that it's a kind of non-covariant part. And we have a flux over here that it's a, that means that we are at the end of the day, we are going to, to obtain some kind of connection over there. So this is a natural proposal. We can start considering this kind of deformations in a double field theory approach. And if we demand, demand compatibility, this is a kind of compatibility condition. Our, this is the invariant group metric, recall, this is an, the group invariant metric over here. Which group? ODD. This is the group invariant metric. It's an ODD invariant metric. We are turning off our gauge sector. We are just focused on double field theory. And our new transformations need to, uh, need to be compatible with this metric. So T1 and T2 are not independent. If we compute this, this transformation, you will obtain that T1 and T2 depends each other. So if we propose a kind of T1, then our T2 is completely fixed, is fixed because of this compatibility condition. So T2 has this form over here. This is our T2. This is the generalized Green Schwartz mechanism for the other projection of the flux. So uh, we can write this, this generalized green schwartz mechanism that depends on one parameter over here. We have this parameter. The idea of this parameter is that uh, every, every coefficient here is, uh, uh, every coefficient tries to, to we are trying to obtain this, this configuration, A equal minus one as heterotic sugra, as heterotic sugra upon, parametrization that's why we are we are choosing some some special factors over here or coefficients in order to fix and in order to be consistent with the version of the rule approach we are always trying to connect double field theory with the version of the rule approach recall that we start with the metaip saitin approach that this was obtain considering three point functions and four point function. And this metzaev setting approach uh, is completely equivalent, equivalent to the of the rule approach. This is the supergravity level. At the supergravity level, we, we explore these approaches in our first lecture. Now we are trying to construct some deformation of double field theory in order to match with this approach, with the of the rule approach. 
So we are proposing a new transformation for our generalized field bind. This is our new transformation, this term over here. And the conventions over here is that we have this, these indices over here are anti-symmetric, but you can see this minus over here, but the projections remain unchanged. The projections are still in the first letter, as you can see over here. This is the convention that, that we use. I use this convention also in my lecture notes. And this is a, this is a kind of proposal for the Green Schwartz mechanism. Of course, we do not need since we are using heuristic arguments, we do not need some kind of first order transformation for the dilaton field. We, we, don't, we do not need something like, like this. We are going to impose not green Schwartz for the dilaton. We do not need a, a green Schwartz transformation for the dilaton. At least for now, we are trying to use some heuristic arguments to, to perform this, this construction. So, we have proposed a generalized green chart transformation for the generalized frame from heuristic reason, reasoning, and we do not have reason to propose a first order double transformation for the generalized dilaton or even first order diffeomorphisms. We are not deforming our diff generalized diffeomorphisms transformation. We are only deforming the Lorentz transformations to first order. So we now we can test we can test this this modification. And Emmanuel, you can ask your question if you want. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, um, is there a different way to think about this transformation? I mean, as you say, like here, it's sort of heuristic and because you know what you want to get, but is there some either geometric perspective on this or some other perspective that if you woke up one day and you thought about, you would get exactly this kind of transformation, not knowing about Green Schwartz? Well, the, the 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 geometric intuition or the or the, the the way to construct this kind of transformation from first principle, the only way I know is the generalized Green Schwartz transformation that we are going to see in a few, few minutes. This this kind of transformations, we are going to obtain this kind of transformations performing a, a kind of identification between some degrees of freedom at the DFT level. And this transformation uh, is going to appear in that way. But for now, I am just introducing this in a heuristic, in a heuristic way. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So something interesting over here is that we are constructing a Green Schwartz transformation for our generalized frame. We are constructing a generalized Green Schwartz transformation for this object. And this object, in some sense, puts on equal foot these fields, the field line and the B field. Recall that we are turning off the gauge part, so we, we only have this block of the, of the frame. And in some sense, uh, it's difficult to us to ask to ensure that our field line is not going to, up, uh, to obtain a kind of green Schwartz deformation because of the green Schwartz deformation of the generalized frame. We want that our fields transform in this way. We, we need a green Schwartz transformation only for the B field, but we don't want a green Schwartz transformation for the field line. And since we cannot ensure this, instead of parametrizing with our standard fields, instead of parametrizing, with these fields, with A and B, we are going to parametrize with this tilde objects since these tilde objects could be related with the, suppose that these are the bears of the roof, these are the bears of the roof fields, and these are our fields from double field theory, and this set of fields could be related through non-covariant field redefinitions or covariant field redefinitions. So uh, um, the, the most sure uh, way to, to try to perform a construction is to, to define these tilde fields and then check if we need non-covariant field redefinitions. That's the reason why we start by considering this new set of fields. Our parametrization will be done with this kind of tilde fields, E tilde and B tilde. At the end of the day, we want a green Schwartz mechanism only for the B field. So 
if we inspect the transformation, the transformation rule, I think this is part of an exercise, but you have the, the answer over here. You can try to, to perform this com computation for your own and compare with, with this computation. If you find any typo, just uh, send me a message in order to, to fix the typo. But the idea here is that if we know what is the transformation rule of this object over here, we know the transformation rule at the DFT level, and we, and we know the parametrization. The parametrization of this object is, uh, is related to, let, let me check for a moment, I should, use a tilde over here. This is a tilde. I forgot the tilde. We know how to parameterize this field. This field depends on the tilde fields. So we can try to analyze this transformation and start to parameterize this transformation over here. For example, this is the green Schwartz mechanism, but we are, we are uh, parameterizing some objects. For example, the PBR first is this combination this is a projector with curved indices, and the, the, the definition of the projector with the curved indices is exactly the same as the flat one. We have the sum of the invariant metrics. This is the generalized metric. Um, I should say that the generalized metric, this generalized metric over here that you have parameterized with Gianluca, can be constructed from the field line in this way. You can construct this metric in this way. And of course, the, the invariant metric, eta mn, is obtained through the generalized field line in this way, considering the other metric. The, these are the two invariant Lorentz metric. So if you perform, perform this computation, at the end of the day, we are going to obtain some extra terms over here. We are going to obtain some extra terms. In fact, the V contributions cancel each other, and we have just one term over here. I am going to show you this term. If, you, if we parameterize our Green Schwartz proposal, we obtain this transformation. We obtain a Lorentz transformation. Okay, this is what we want. We want just this term, but we obtain an extra Green Schwartz transformation. This is extra. We don't want this transformation. This is an extra piece. It's an extra Green Schwartz transformation for the field line. And we want only a Green Schwartz transformation for the B field because we want the action to be Lorentz invariant. If we use this transformation, the action will be Lorentz invariant, but the form of the action uh, is not the form of the version of the rule action. It's another action, it's a different action. We, we, we need an action to be, uh, we want to match with the version of the rule approach. And in this sense, we are not, because we have a different transformation over here. So we need to consider non-covariant field redefinitions in order to make this extra term to disappear. And of course, this is the transformation for the inverse of the field line. And we can, and we can compute the transformation of the ordinary field line, considering that the Minkowski metric uh, must be invariant under this transformation. So we can, we can obtain the other transformation for the ordinary field line. This is the transformation, it's quite similar, but we don't want this kind of transformation. This is a Green-Schwartz mechanism that we do not want. We need to trivialize this transformation. It's important to trivialize this transformation. Recall that we construct our Green-Schwartz from heuristic arguments. And um, in this sense, we are still not obtaining what we want. We are obtaining a deformed transformation for the field line, and we only want deformation for the B field. And um, this kind of transformation can be easily removed since this part, the red part of the transformation, is the form of a non covariant part of the spin connection in supergravity. If you recall the transformation of the spin connection, I'm going to write it. So, transformation of the spin connection, the zero order transformation of the spin connection, maybe it's equal to minus partial derivative of lambda AB plus a covariant part, plus covariant terms. This is the transformation of the connection, the leading order transformation. Since this is a first order transformation, we only need the leading order transformation of the uh, spin connection. 
So in this sense, this tilde over here, it's the same to, to, to put the tilde or to, to remove the tilde, it's exactly the same. This tilde is just uh, deforming the transformation to second order and we, we, don't, we, don't, we are not interested in, the, in, in, this, in that order, sorry. So at this point, the important thing here is that we need to trivialize this transformation in order to try to match with the version of the rule approach. Um, if someone has a question, please go, go ahead. And perhaps I am going too quick over here. Or if, if something is not clear, you can, you can ask. The idea is that I am trying to, to use some ansatz to construct the generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism, but this generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism, uh, when I parameterize that mechanism, I am obtaining a Green-Schwartz mechanism for the field line. And that mechanism, uh, we, don't, we do not want that, that mechanism because in the green shorts, in the, sorry, in the version of the rule approach, the field line transform in the covariant way, just with, with the leading order term. So this is our new field. This is our field. This is the field that we can call the version of the rule field. This is the version of the rule field. And it's related to the previous one. This is the one which appear from double field theory, and it's related through this non-covariant field redefinitions. Of course, we can remove the tildes, as I was saying, because they contribute to second order. This means that we can invert this relation very easily. The, the, if we want to invert this relation, we just move this term to the other side and forget about the tildes, and that's the, 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 the inverted map in between these both fields. Um, if we transform the right hand side of this new field, this new field transform in the ordinary in the ordinary way, this part of the transformation combines with this part in order to construct this transformation. And this extra part, we have extra terms over here. This extra term can be absorbed in a new Lorentz parameter. We can redefine the Lorentz parameter. I am not showing you a new Lorentz parameter since I don't want to write more letters over here. But the idea here is that we can trivialize a first order transformation that came from, from a double field theory perspective or from a double field theory formalism, just uh, relabel, relabeling our fields. This is the version of the rule, um, the version of the rule field in some sense. It transformed as a version of the rule field. Recall that we do not have an action. We do not have a procedure to construct the four derivative action. We are just trying uh, to analyze a proposal to obtain the, the transformations first. So uh, uh, for this, uh, oh, uh, up to now, this, this proposal is good because we are obtaining what we want. This is the transformation rule that we want. This is okay for now. Our proposal is okay. This is okay. This is coming from double field theory. And finally, if we inspect the other component, and this is part, this is part of an exercise of the of the list that you have. It's not uh, it's not complicated. Um, if we inspect the other, if we inspect the other component, this component over here. And we know this transformation, we know this transformation, and we know this transformation over here. We can just try to figure out what is this transformation coming from double field theory. And the answer is that this transformation is okay. It's completely okay. This, this means that the tilde V, tilde V field is exactly the version of the root field. It's transformed in the, in the same way. This means that these fields can be in some sense identified. Identi yeah. I, I, I think that I can say that they transform in the same way. They transform with a green Schwartz mechanism with a torsion term over here. That's why this torsion term over here is saying that we are matching with the um, version of the rule formalism. In the metzaev seidlin approach, we have no torsion in our green Schwartz mechanism. So we are, we are in, in some sense, we are uh, performing this this uh, map, we have the metzaev setting approach, which is completely equivalent to the version of the root approach. And we are starting with the DFT plus 
a green Schwartz mechanism, and we are obtaining version of the rule in some sense, just at the level of the transformations for now. Then we are going to construct the action. But this is how things work. Recall that from string theory, the scattering amplitude computations was this one. So we are we can match with meta setting approach, performing a field redefinition, parameterizing double field theory, of course, with a green trust mechanism over here. We parameterize that, we obtain something similar to the version of the rule approach because we are working with these tilde fields. We perform a non-covariant field redefinition for the field line, and we obtain the version of the rule uh, act, uh, and transformations, the version of the root transformations. This map is at the level of the transformations. So finally, the idea is uh, we have constructed this, we have constructed this Green Schwartz mechanism at the DFT level, but we still need the four derivative terms. We still need these four derivative corrections at the DFT level. We, we need some heuristic argument, but the problem here is that heuristic argument are very, very hard to perform since we do not have a Riemann tensor. So we cannot, um, we cannot um, propose a kind of Riemann square term at the DFT level because the Riemann tensor is not completely determined in double field theory. So this heuristic argument, uh, it, it's really hard to, to perform in this way. So our best option is to look for a systematic method. This was what Emmanuel was asking. We want a kind of um, geometric procedure in order to obtain both these terms in the action and the transformations. And the reason why we need extra terms over here, the reason what we need why we need extra terms over here is that this Green Schwartz mechanism at the DFT level transform the zero order action. This is different to zero. We have contributions, first order contributions coming from here. So we need this piece in the Lagrangian in order to compensate the new terms. This action without this term, this action is not invariant when we consider the generalized Green Schwartz mechanism. So we are going to we are we, we are going to to I am going to show you a systematic method to con to construct both the generalized Green Schwartz transformations and the and the and this extra piece of the action. But before doing before doing so, let's analyze the biparametric extension. We want uh, the, the, the full version of the rule approach. And in that approach, we have two parameters, A and B, this a biparametric family. So before going to, the, to this systematic method, let's try to talk about the biparametric extension. This is still heuristic. We have here a Green-Schwartz mechanism for, for the A parameter and a Green-Schwartz mechanism for the B parameter. This proposal, we can understand this proposal again, because in this case, this flux was related to the spin connection with torsion, with the minus torsion, and this flux over here is related to the plus connection with torsion, the spin connection with torsion. So this is a very natural proposal. And of course, we are trying to fix our coefficients in order to have this as a bosonic double field theory, this selection as a heterotic double field theory and the trivial one as type two double field theory. And over here, there is an extra nice combination that it's related to minus one and one, and that it's called the uh, HSC theory that is written in terms of the double field theory fundamental fields in terms of the generalized metric and the dilaton. This is not a string theory. This combination is not a string theory, but the corrections of this combination are very close to the corrections of the, of the heterotic string to the first order. At first order in, in, in derivatives, this theory gives results very similar to the heterotic case. And to second order, this theory, this is to first order, this is I can say I can say alpha prime here because this is not a string theory, but uh, when we consider four derivative terms, when we consider four derivative terms, this theory gives results very close to the heterotic theory. And uh, when we consider six derivative terms, this theory gives results very similar to the bosonic case. For example, we can recover some um, Gauss-Bonnet terms, Riemann um, Riemann cubic term 
from this HRC theory. So this is for six derivatives. And this combination between heterotic and bosonic, this, this kind of uh, stuff uh, is happening to all orders in this HSC theory. So I am not going to talk about this theory anymore, but you can read about this in my lecture notes and also in the references of the notes. So when we consider both parameters, a and B, we can perform the, the, same, the same computation in order to compute the transformation of the field bind. The transformation of the field bind now contains two pieces. This, we don't want these pieces because these are green Schwartz mechanisms for the field bind, and we need to remove this kind of transformations. So David, we need to I just, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, but because it's a question for the last slide, so before we, we go too far. Uh, this um, this model, this HSZ, I mean, is it just a curiosity that you have this uh, relation to heterotic and bosonic um, uh, DFT? Because, I mean, just uh, maybe for me to understand, is it useful to study this HSZ to understand heterotic or bosonic, or just it is just um, one, one saw that is actually this relation and it's more of a curiosity? Maybe my, my question is, does it help to understand heterotic and bosonic, or is it just a, a coincidence that one sees that no. order by all? Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a very good question. And this HSC theory is related to a conformal field theory in the double space. The construction comes from a conformal field theory. So HSC theory is very interesting in, in, that, in that sense because uh, it's constructing from this, from this point of view. And it's a theory that, that can be constructed only with a generalized metric. You don't need to use the frame. It's not supersymmetric invariant. And, and first of all, the people in, the, in, the, in double field theory, um, in double field theory start studying this HSC theory because of its relation with CFT uh, at the double space. And, and and in some sense, HSC theory contains all the corrections. It's very useful to construct the bosonic part, for example, because contain all the corrections, but with, with some special powers of the V field. There is a, 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 a nice C2, C2 symmetry over here, and that's why uh, we can obtain the full corrections for the bosonic, but just with some special powers of B field. Um, and that's why, it, it, it's very useful to construct half, if you want, half of the heterotic or half of the bosonic case. And a, a very good open problem over here is that this HSC theory was a study from the generalized metric formalism in this formalism. So we still, this, this relation with these parameters coming from the, the frame, coming from the frame formulation must be correct this is this this must be completely correct, but nobody showed uh, up to now. Nobody sh explicitly showed that this selection of parameters coming from the from this Green Schwartz mechanism is completely in agreement with the HSC construction. This, if you want, this is a kind of conjecture. If you see the the construction of the HSC theory is completely performed in this formalism in the frame form in the generalized metric formalism, and the deformations of the transformations are in the generalized diffeomorphisms. So to turn this transformation into generalized diffeomorphism transformation is an open problem still for the first order correction. So in this sense, it's very interesting because everybody talks about this theory as a, an election of parameter over here, just as I, I have done, just I have done in, in that way. But the, the real story is that it, nobody shows that this is exactly the same, but should be. There are strong arguments that we can uh, relate this green short transformation with the deformation of the of the diffeomorphisms to first order. But that's why it's very interesting this theory. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. You're welcome. So, ah, uh, uh, sorry, Emmanuel. Yeah, sorry. Can I actually ask about the parameters? Um, the, I mean, it seems like you, the. The scale is not important of the parameters, right? Um, because that's just alpha prime in some sense, and probably the other scale you can also reabsorb into f. But um, it seems like then only the sign is important. Um, why is it clear that there shouldn't be a theory which has one comma one uh, for a and b, or 
is that also somehow just a redefinition? Yes, uh, I, I think so. One, one comma one, I think it's just a, a parameter redefinition. Uh, the information is still the same as the bosonic case. That there, there are uh, there is no another theory over there. For example, if so, sorry, if, if you consider uh, um, zero comma minus one, if you consider this combination over here, for example, if you mm -hmm. consider, let, let me write, if you consider this combination, zero comma minus one, this is heterotic up to yeah. a C2 um, transformation. This, this, this change of parameter is a C2 transformation. So in, in the 1,1, 1, 1, it, it's exactly the same as a 1,1 1, 1 from a C2 point of view. But in that case, you are just rescaling the parameter. You're just rescaling A and B. That the information is the same as the positioning case. OK. Um, so these are really the only four possibilities yes, that you could have. I think so. Okay. I, I think so. And um, if you choose parameters in a different way from this, this is the only election. Minus one one is the only election where you can write all your theory in terms of the generalized metric formulation. If you choose uh, uh, the parameters in a different way from HSC theory, we are always working in the frame formalism or the flux formalism, but you can't write your first order action, for example, or transformation instead only instead of the generalized metric. This means that your Lorentz invariance uh, is not manifest in some, in some sense. When you work with a generalized metric approach, you, you don't have your loaded symmetry because it's, it's implicit in your formulation. Um, okay, uh, thanks. No, no, that, that's, that's very clear. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So let's move. The idea here is exactly the same. We can perform the field of definitions. We have now extra field of definitions. We are connecting the tilde fields with both parameters. Now we have this parameter over here and this parameter over here. Now we have both torsions, minus and plus, but the story is exactly the same. We can perform these field definitions in order to trivialize the transformation of the field line. And again, the B field, the tilde B field, is exactly the same of the version of the root. We can obtain this as the, the version of the root. I think that in my second lecture, uh, I, I have written this transformation in a different way, but you can prove that this is exactly, this could be an exercise if you want, this is exactly the way that the B field transform in the version of the rule approach in this, in this B parametric family of transformations. This is exactly the same, but if you are not sure, you can do this as an exercise. Okay, finally, I, I must, must say that if the, if the field line is being redefined, we also need to redefine the dilaton. Uh, when a field line redefinition is performed, you always need to redefine the dilaton. We, um, we are not going to, I am not going to talk about uh, much about this. It's just a computation, but your dilaton need to be redefined. So this is in some sense over here, our, our fields from double field theory are G tilde, B tilde and phi tilde. And we need to move to these new fields that these are the version of the rule fields. These are the version of the rule. And even the dilaton need to be redefined. In some sense, these tilde fields transform covariantly under the Boucher rules. This transform covariantly under the Boucher rules. And this object over here transform covariantly under diffeomorphisms and Lorentz invariant. This is the difference between the tilde fields and the and, and this other set of tilde of fields. We are always working with this. Um, Trivia, uh, with, with these fields, with the version of the rule uh, approach fields. So we need to redefine our fields when we came from double field theory. Well, okay. Um, and of course, we still need a recipe. We, we, we still need a, a kind of construction for this. We, we don't know what is the form of this, uh, uh, this action over here. And we need this because this transformation uh, acts in a non-trivial way. Um, well, in the two derivative action. So we need to ensure invariance and we need to construct a four derivative action or Lagrangian at the DFT level. So here you have a lot of exercises to practice. Uh, in, uh, you, uh, I, I guess you're not going to have much time to do this part, 
but you can send me an email whenever you want and we discuss about these exercises. So here uh, we have some aspects to summarize. In this part, we have constructed the generalized screen short transformation from heuristic arguments. And um, the, the, the idea was to, to propose this kind of transformations for the frame field only. Then we parameterized this in terms of these fields, these tilde fields. We found that the, the way that this, this tilde field line transform, we have to redefine. We, then we, we, we find this transformation, this transformation is okay. We do not need field redefinitions for the, field, for the B field. The B field is okay. And finally, we have. Uh, we need to demand uh, to have a good measure. We need to redefine also the dilaton in order to, to match with the version of the rule approach at the level of the transformations only. We need an action, and we are going to construct that, that action in the next part. But let's take a five minutes break, and 12.50, we continue. Thanks, Eric. Now we start again in five minutes.
<clears throat> okay, may I continue? Yes, you can continue. Wait, no, 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 just a second, the recording, because... Uh, yeah. No, you can uh, start again, Eric. Okay, so let's talk about the generalized branch of the rule identification. In the previous lecture, we studied an alternative method to obtain to obtaining the gravitational four derivative terms in heterotic supergravity. This was the verge of the rule identification. The idea here was to start with the gauge supergravity. With this is the gauge field. This is our gauge field. This is our gauge field. And this is our gauge parameter. We start by considering a gauge supergravity, and then we can perform this kind of identifications. These are our identifications. We always, we are, we are working in this way to the, to the right in order to transform or, yes, to transform this gauge field into a gauge connection, and in order to transform this gauge parameter into a Lorentz parameter. This is a Lorentz parameter, and this is a gauge connection. And we use the, we use this map considering generators, we, we define generators in order to perform this identification. And this identification allows us to construct corrections for heterotic supergravity at the level of the action and symmetries, both. We could obtain the action, the Riemann square term with torsion, the Riemann square term and the Green-Schwartz mechanism, the gravitational one, from the, the gauge Green-Schwartz mechanism and the uh, young mills terms in the action. So this was uh, done in the previous lecture, and now we want this in double field theory. So the idea now is to generalize the version of the right identification and to impose such identification at the gauge DFT level, but we have an immediate problem. Our immediate problem is that we do not have a generalized gauge field. We do not have a gauge field in terms of the in, in double field theory, our, our gauge fields are inside the generalized frame or the generalized metric. We do not have a, a, generalized, a generalized field, gauge field, and we do not have a generalized gauge symmetry. We do not have a, a gauge parameter in our gauge double field theory. So this is the geometric and systematic method that I was talking to, to Emmanuel. A possible solution is to break this group. This is the, the duality group for the gauge double field theory, we are using this k instead of n, uh, but it's exactly the same. We are starting from a gauge double field theory. These are representation of this group, of the ODD plus k group, but we are trying to, to write all our theory in terms of representations of the standard ODD. So we are trying to convert our gauge double field theory. In both cases, this is a gauge double field theory, but if we write this gauge double field theory in terms of these fields, we, are, we, we do not have this kind of, of gauge fields explicitly in our theory. And if we write our ODD plus K invariant theory in terms of ODD representations, now this theory, uh, this, this field, sorry, appear. Now we have a, a kind of gauge field to identify with a kind of connection in, in, in terms of double field theory. So we need to, perform this, uh, we need to break the, our representation, our ODD plus K representation. This is just a possible solution, but it's a geometric one. It's a geometric solution in order to have a gauge field and a gauge parameter at the DFT level. This is a still a gauge double field theory in both cases. So formally, we start by considering a generalized frame our, we start considering a generalized frame for gauge. Uh, sorry, I think I was using the colors in, in a different way. Let me change my color. I want to erase this. Let me try to use yellow for the for these fields. This is this is our generalized frame, and this generalized frame is going to be break in this way. This is our generalized frame, and our new degrees of freedom is a general, an ODD generalized frame. This is an ODD, and this is an ODD plus K. I am changing color, sorry. This calligraphic frame is an ODD plus K frame, and we want to replace this generalized frame 
um, with this other frame and this other field. And we have this, 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 this object here is a constant object, is a constant. This is a constant. So it carries no dynamics. We are trying to write this, the, the ODD plus K field line in terms of uh, uh, an ODD field line and a new gauge field. This is very similar to a Calusa plain decomposition as you have studied with Gianluca. It's very, very similar. And we are going to try to write our gauge double field theory in terms of these degrees of freedom. Our gauge double field theory will, will, will be writing with these degrees of freedom. So let's try to understand the index decomposition. Our calligraphic index, it's going, uh, it's turning into two indices. An ODD index, this is our own ODD index. This is the ODD index. This index lies in the fundamental representat representation of ODD. And this other index is a kind of gauge index. It's a curve gauge index. And the same, have, the same is for the flat decomposition. In the flat decomposition, I'm marking both indices. In the flat decomposition, we have the calligraphic one that it's in the double extended Lorentz group. Um, and then we have this new index, this flat index at the, uh, this is the, the ordinary Lorentz group over here. We have the ordinary double group. This is just like an extended double Lorentz group. And we have the, the flat version of the gauge index. index. So that's the idea. I am just erasing this. That, that's the idea of, of the, of the breaking of the representations. And when we break the representation, we obtain what we want, a gauge field, an explicit gauge field in order to identify with something and to perform this generalized version of the rule identification. So this object, this constant objects over here, recall that these are constant objects. These constant objects are related with a cartan killing metric but at the DFT, at the DFT level, now these indices are quite similar. You can think in these indices, very sim if these indices are very similar to the gauge indices, to these indices. You can think uh, about these indices as gauge indices. These indices over here runs from one to K are gauge indices. And these are the flat version of these indices running from one to K. This is, this is the idea. And this object over here, we have defined here some special functions over here or matrices. These matrices are defined in this way. So contains different powers of the uh, gauge field. Now we have a gauge field, an explicit gauge field at the DFT level or at the gauge double field theory level. This is the idea of this construction. We are trying to break the the duality group, the heterotic duality group, and we are writing our degrees of freedoms in terms of ODD multiplets. Um, we need to impose some um, gauge fixing over here. We need to impose this condition over here in order to the A field to be a vector. We want an ODD vector over here. That's why the only relevant projection over here is, is this one. This is our gauge field. And the idea is to turn this gauge field to identify gauge to identify this gauge field with something in order to perform a generalized version of the row identification. So we have um, different gauge fixings. For example, we have um, we, we 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 have this 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 relation over here, which will require suitable gauge fixing. We need to perform several gauge fixings in order to match this. ODD plus N multiplet representation in terms of the ODD one. We have several gauge fixing to perform. And we have a, a, this kind of decompositions in terms of the, of the projectors also. These are the cure projectors. These are constructed in the same way of these ones, exactly the same, but using the generalized metric and the invariant metric instead of the flat metrics. But if you can see this projector is mainly the same, it's the ordinary one and the same for this one. And in this case, we have both the Lorentz, the, sorry, the, the, the P-bar part and the, and the Cartan-Killing metric. So in one side, 
Uh, in some sense, we have our gauge part in one side, and that's why this is an ODD plus K formulation and not uh, ODD plus K comma, comma D. Uh, and that, that's the reason we are putting our gauge sector in the, in the right part. And now the extended symmetries, this is, this is the symmetry rule from our ODD plus K point of view. This is the transformation of our fields from the ODD plus K. And with this, with this decomposition, we are obtaining uh, parameters at the DFT level with an explicit parameter. This is what we want, the explicit parameter, the exp an explicit gauge parameter. And we need to analyze the transformations of the component of these fields, since each component of this field is going to transform in a different way. From here, we can obtain the transformations. From here, we can obtain the transformations of this other field band from the ODD field uh, frame, sorry. And we can obtain the transformation of this other object, of this gauge field. Now we are writing our gauge um, double field theory in terms of this, both these degrees of freedom. Okay, the structure constant over here is exactly the same as a gauge double field theory, since this is a gauge double field theory. So this object takes values only when these indices are the gauge indices. And the derivative is splitting according to this. So for example, for the dilaton, the transformation of the dilaton is exactly the same as in, in ordinary double field theory. We have this index now without calligraphic. We can forget about the calligraphic over here. And we have this other term over here without the calligraphic with this parameter over here. No calligraphics. Here, I am no, not writing calligraphic over here since we have this condition for the derivatives. We have, this is exactly the same as the proposal for, for, from the previous lecture. We do not have dependence on the extra coordinates. Um, so the transformation for the, for the dilaton is okay. And we need to explore the transformation. We need to explore these transformations over here, the transformation for the ODD frame and the ODD gauge field. Once these transformations uh, are explored, then we can perform the, the generalized version of the row identification. So we have some gauge fixings. For example, this parameter over here is completely fixed. It's not arbitrary, this, this parameter. Recall that we are dealing with this kind of objects. We have these objects. A and B. Uh, I am going to write this with this other index in order to be more pedagogical. These are, this is our starting parameter. And we have different combinations over here. For example, we can take the combination, a gauge index over here and a flat index over here. There are a lot of combinations, but this combination is completely fixed. It's not arbitrary. This is not zero, for example. This must be this, uh, this uh, equation over here in order to obtain a good compatibility condition with our generalized frame uh, decomposition. This part must be zero. So this must compensate this other, uh, other thing. And just, we are just writing the inverse of this part. The inverse of this part is this, is this uh, object over here with minus one over two. So some parameters from the double Lorentz invariance must be completely fixed in order to this decomposition from ODD plus K to ODD work, works. So this is one of the gauge fixings. We have another gauge fixing because this object must, must carry no dynamics. So we have another gauge fixing, this other com uh, component. Again, if you analyze this object, with the calligraphic index, again, we have this other option with both gauge, flat gauge uh, combinations over there. So again, this object uh, is completely fixed by this decomposition. We can't, this is not arbitrary. This cannot be zero because we need that this object carry no dynamics. 
So this is not a fundamental field. Our fundamental fields from um, ODD plus K point of view is a generalized field band and a generalized dilaton. And from an ODD point of view, our, our fundamental fields are an ODD frame, frame field with this configuration, this new gauge field, and of course, the dilaton. So we, we, we want that this object over here carries no dynamics. So we, impose the, we fix this, this part of the Lorentz symmetry in order to have this, this kind of uh, decomposition or in order to have a well-defined decomposition. These are OD D plus K representations, rep, and these over here are ODD rep representations. So recall that we are performing all this decomposition because we need this part. We need this ob object over here. We need the gauge, an explicit gauge field. So we are going to identify this gauge field, this generalized gauge field with some notion of connection in order to perform a generalized version of the version of the Y identification. That, that is the main idea of this construction. So, the transformation rules for the ODD field content can be written in terms of this field. Instead of using the A field, we can use this C field. It's mainly the same. Uh, at the leading order, these both fields are exactly the same because um, you need to think about these gauge fields as derivatives. Recall that, recall that in the uh, in the version of the row identity, we were identifying the gauge field with a spin connection with torsion. And, it's, and this spin connection with torsion contains one derivative. So recall that our gauge field in some sense uh, is related to derivatives. This, this um, gauge fields over here, it's related to a derivative. So here, it, it, here you have over here, you have a kind of um, a kind of expansion in terms of derivatives, because if you have some power over here, you just expand with the Taylor expansion and you have a, a lot of corrections over here. This is the idea of the identification. Our gauge field content or our gauge degrees of freedom are gravitational degrees of freedom. And of course, uh, this, introduce, uh, or this introduces derivatives to our, to our theory. The, 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 the idea, the main idea is to turn this gauge double field theory, we want to turn this gauge DFT into a DFT plus higher derivative terms. These higher derivative terms are going to appear uh, performing an identification, a generalization to this identification. We are going to take this A field over here and we are going to identify this A field, this generalized gauge field with some kind, we are going to identify with a flux, with, a, with some projection of the fluxes. So this is the idea of the generalized version of the rule identification. So if we inspect the transformation for the generalized field line, and that was, uh, th this was Emmanuel's question, if we perform this decomposition, we obtain the generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism that we want, we need to identify this this parameter with the, the, with the ordinary Lorentz parameter in double field theory, but we can reproduce a green schwartz transformation, of course, that we need to take this part that it's a gauge transformation, and we need to turn this gauge transformation into a gravitational one. But this is the idea. We recover this term from the ODD plus K, from the ODD plus K to ODD decomposition. In doing this decomposition, a, a gauge transformation appear and performing an identification between this C field or the A field with a flux, with a flux, for example, in this sense, and the parameter with this parameter, we can make appear a green Schwartz mechanism from geometric principles. We are not we, we are not dealing with heuristic arguments anymore. We are just performing a very formal decomposition from ODD plus K fundamental fields to ODD representations. And we only need to perform this kind of general, generalized version of the row identification that this is mainly what, what is happening over here. These, these, these arrows over here are the generalized version of the row identification. 
So we are obtaining this from, from first principles, if you want. So the transformation of the other projection is a little more tricky. You can read about this in my lecture notes, but the idea is that, that you can write this transformation in, in a sense of green Schwartz mechanism. If you want, this is a kind of green Schwartz mechanism. This is a kind, a kind of green Schwartz mechanism for a gauge transformation. For a gauge transformation, we still need this kind of version of the rule identification at the DFT level. That's why we, we talk about generalized. We always talk about generalized when we talk about double field theory. So uh, uh, in, in here, we have a gauge transformation, and we want to turn this gauge transformation at the DFT level to into a, a Lorentz, a first order Lorentz transformation. So this is the idea. But this is very interesting because this C field over here has an expansion of derivatives. So in some sense, we are not working at leading order. We are not working to first order. We are performing a, a formal identification. And up to this moment, we are working to all orders in higher derivative terms, or if you want, in alpha prime corrections. This, this is working to all orders up to this. But now we are going to um, to focus, um, the, in this sense, we are working to all orders. This is an all order transformation. This is the way this field transformed to all orders. We can obtain this transformation from the transformation of the generalized frame, as we were talking. We can obtain this transformation or the transformation of the A field. You can try to obtain this other transformation. I think this is part of the exercises in list three to obtain this transformation. Uh, it's it's um, it's a very quick computation, but the idea here is that we have an expansion over here. Recall that the C field contains an expansion. So up to up to this point, we are working to all orders in alpha prime. Uh, I don't like using alpha prime in the DFT approach, but if you want, we are working to all orders in derivatives, since we have this kind of expansion. These boxes over here are talking about higher derivative terms, not only, not only the leading order contributions. So in order to talk about the four derivative terms, we need to perform a kind of, um, a kind of approximation. And I am going to show you that approximation, uh, but, uh, but let me summarize some results at this point. We have constructed a, a gauge double field theory, but in terms of these fields, these fields as degrees of freedom, we could extract the transformation rules for, for these fields. And these transformation rules are very similar to a green schwartz mechanism, at least to the first order. We have obtained the transformation rule of this other field, the C field, that it's very close to the A field. It's just a sign, a minus sign of difference to lead in order. And then we have the transformation of the dilaton. This perspective is very good. We have the gauge field and the gauge parameter. This is the gauge parameter. But we have these fields and parameter at, at the gauge double field theory level. And now we can impose a generalized version of the rule identification. So let's try to, to understand the first order. In the first order, we, we need to, to work in this approximation where this box is just a kappa. So this huge transformation over here, we have a, a huge transformation over here, but this term over here, and this term over here can be a uh, sum because the derivative of a gauge parameter is the same. Let me see if the indices are correct over here. I think so. This decomposition can be, um, the, 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 we can use the projector to write this in this way with both projections of the curve index. So this term over here exactly cancels this contribution over here. So we have only this contribution, the underlying contribution here, and we have this extra term. And we are expecting that the second term of this transformation turns into a non-covariant double Lorentz transformation and the third one into a covariant Lorentz transformation. This should be a covariant. This should be the covariant part and this should be the non-covariant part. So if this happens, we could identify the C field or the A field to this order is exactly the same, the C field or the, or the A field with a flux, a component of the fluxes. This is what we want. Is there any question? Sorry. 
now. So let me go on. The study is exactly the same. We define the generators, the gauge generators, and pay attention, pay attention with this. We are identifying the, the gauge group with the right part of the Lorentz group at the ODD level. So we have over here some, some special factors that will be, will be defined, not defined, will be identified in a moment. They are related to the A parameter. We have these identifications or this map that it's very similar to the ordinary Perch of the Rue identification. And if we perform this identification over the transformation of the frame, for example, or over the transformation of the C field, this is exactly the way that the flux is transformed. So we can identify this object in this way. This is very expected to us. And the correction to the transformation rule of the generalized frame now takes the form of a generalized Green-Schwarz mechanism. We could obtain this mechanism with this definition of the XR uh, parameter. We, we, we obtain this Green-Schwarz mechanism, but from a geometric point of view or from a, of a geometric principle. This was our heuristic proposal, but this heuristic proposal is very in agreement with the ODD plus K to ODD decomposition. But this is very, very good because we, we obtain the transformations, but we can perform the same map. We can perform this, uh, sorry. We can perform these identifications in order, we can perform these identifications in order to construct the action principle, in order to construct the four derivative terms in the heterotic double field theory formulation. Uh, and then we can prove that th that action is related to the version of the rule approach. So all our effort has produced the same correction that we have proposed in the beginning of the lecture to the form the learned transformation. However, now we have a systematic procedure. This is the idea to have a systematic procedure. This is the idea to the form double field theory and the previous identification can be applied, for instance, on the ODD plus K action principle. This ODD action, this ODD plus K action principle is going to turn into a four derivative corrections or a DFT Lagrangian plus four derivative corrections um, to the heterotic DFT Lagrangian. So in order to construct the higher derivative action, we need some components of the fluxes. These are the fluxes from an ODD plus K perspective. The, the form of the action is exactly the same, but these fluxes, these calligraphic fluxes depend on, of course, depend on the calligraphic frame and the dilaton, but we can write this in, ter in terms, sorry, of the ordinary frame, the ODD frame, the A field and the dilaton. So then we can use this identification, this generalized version of the rule identification in order to obtain the four derivative action. This is the idea. The idea is to start with an ODD plus K theory and the ODD plus K from the ODD plus K point of view, I have a two derivative theory, but if we perform this decomposition and this identification, I can obtain four derivative terms. This is the systematic procedure. So for example, these fluxes, these calligraphic fluxes from the ODD plus K point of view depend of the, on the ordinary ones. This is the ordinary ones. These fluxes are constructed with the ODD uh, frame. Here we have the ODD um, frame dependence is the ordinary one. And here we have performed the identification. We use the generalized identification because we are not, uh, uh, we, we use this identification in order to identify this field. We are not seeing this field anymore. We are just observing fluxes. So in this sense, we can construct this, that is the four derivative actions at the DFT level, all these terms, contribute to the action, including this factor over here. Okay, this is the contribution, the four derivative contributions that we need to, to put in here in order to match with, for example, the Bersh of the Rue approach. If you parameterize all this, all this huge action and you perform the non-covariant field redefinition for the field bind and uh, covariant field redefinitions, at the end of the day, you will obtain the version of the rule approach. Obviously, I am not going to do that in this moment because I have 10 last minutes. I have my last 10 minutes. So 
the idea is to um uh, okay okay this reproduces the version of the rule approach in this case just just a second because we completely dropped for like mm. Sorry, Civil. I, I uh, cannot. The slide was because uh, the people here in the room couldn't follow since the internet fell. Oh, like the previous slide, actually. Okay. Do you want me to, to explain this again? Eric? Yes, you can hear me? Hi. Hi, Eric. I think Hi. the internet's down in Santiago. Um, ah, okay, okay. I was so just, um, just wait a little bit. I think I just, it seems this previous slide they didn't they didn't hear. So maybe we can give them a few minutes to reconnect, and then uh, you can restart. Perfect. Thank you very much. Man. Sorry about that. Of course. I, I I hear you very very well, but I cannot hear uh, Civil. Eric, Eric, uh, we are back. Sorry for this. Um, so could you actually yeah, could you recap from from that slide, please? Yes, of course. You hear me well? Much. Sorry for this. No, no, no problem. So we have this generalized version. We have this systematic procedure. The, the, the point is here. The systematic procedure is the generalized version, the rule identification. Of course, this identification is, is, requires the ODD plus K to ODD decomposition. First, we do this decomposition from ODD plus K to ODD to ODD. And then we use the generalized version of the rule identification. This is the idea. And we have, uh, I have shown you that we can construct the generalized green Schwartz mechanism, but now we want the action principle. We want this, the, the action of double field theory. We want to write this action to the uh, something like this, a parameter, an A parameter, and a correction. This is a four derivative. This, these are four derivative terms over here. So we want to obtain this, these terms using first this decomposition, and then using the generalized version of the rule identification in order to remove the, depend, the dependence uh, in the, the gauge field. So this is the idea. I hope the, the sound and the connection is, is OK. Uh, I will continue, but just tell me if there's a problem. I think perhaps it's a problem, right? Sorry. I am not seeing the connection. So I can still hear you. Um, I know they've turned the video off, so I don't know okay, what that no, means. Uh, Eric, yeah, yes. the problem is from our side. The Wi-Fi is not really stable for some reason. Um, yeah. What do we do? Uh, I can stop here if you want. Um, uh, and I can upload my, my slides to the Slack channel, or I can continue the last minutes in the problem session. I don't know. This is the best part. <laughs> um, Eric, just give me a second. I'm just going to try and connect to Slack, see if they're sending any messages. But um, maybe okay. maybe we start an early lunch break and then end it 10 minutes early and then reconvene. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what they say in a sec. OK. I just wait. Yeah, actually, I think we've lost them completely. But so, but I think they're. Their internet's completely down now. So, okay. Um, yeah, sorry about this, Eric. Um, no, no, please. It's completely. Let okay. me try and. Hi, Eric. Uh, may I just ask you a question in the meantime? Of 
Well, Camille, how are you? Um, I was just wondering if the validity of the identification is guaranteed at all order in the related. Sorry, can you answer me again? Because I hear you very low. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, I was wondering if the validity of the identification is guaranteed at all others uh, in the related. Ah. Okay, let me let me try to 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 say what you have said in order to it's okay. You have uh, you answer sorry you ask if this identification is correct to all orders in Alpha Prime. Exactly. Okay, this identification, the identification I show you uh, uh, in this previous slide, this identification from the gauge, from the gauge sector of the gauge tower field theory and the right part of the double Lorentz group, but the ordinary one, this is an identification uh, with the right part of the Lorentz group. This identification is only valid to first order. You only can construct four derivative terms with this identification. Because this, in some terms, this is not exactly what we call in the paper the generalized version of the rule identification. This is a previous step. The generalized one is valid to all orders, but we are. I am going to show you in, in some minutes. And the idea is to identify it with a full group. It's a kind of iterative method in order to obtain higher derivative alpha prime corrections. And that other identification is correct to all orders, but it's correct in the sense that it produces a tower of alpha prime corrections or higher derivative terms. But nowadays, we are not sure uh, that we are, we are very sure that, that they are, these are not all the corrections because we, we are dealing with this Seda, Seda three terms in the Riemann quartic terms. I, I, I think you know what I am talking about. So we have a lot of corrections. We can produce a lot of corrections with the different, with the generalized version of the rule identification. Um, but this is not the whole story. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. I think I have a lot of message on Slack, so. Yeah, Slack sorry, you. sorry, Eric, let, let me summarize to you. Um, so uh, Santiago is dead. Um, <laughs> the Wi-Fi is gone. So they're gonna start the lunch break now. And okay. um, Sibyl or Saskia suggested two possibilities. Um, either we ask, we start, we, we finish your lecture 10 minutes before the end of the lunch break. So we, we, we have the lunch break a little bit shorter and you finish then. Or what we could do is um, you finish now for us, for the online people. And then um, whoever wants to watch it from Santiago can come to your exercise class and they have the video. So wow. however you prefer, I mean, you can do the end now with the online people and then also restart 10 minutes early from lunch or continue in your exercise class, like as, as you wish. I, I, uh, for me, it's exactly the same, exactly the same. And um, perhaps uh, uh, you, you are saying that the present people will see the video and then he, they can ask questions, for example, if they... Or actually, I mean, you can, uh, you can lecture for them in the exercise class or 10 minutes before the, uh, the last 10 minutes of lunch, um, depending on what fits better with your schedule. And then obviously those who can't do either, they can always watch the video. I, I am completely free all the day. So for me, it's exactly, exactly the same. I prefer to do what is best for you and the organization. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking probably just because the internet is a bit bad, maybe it's safer if we, if we do the last 10 minutes of your lecture in the exercise class, I'm thinking, um, okay. just to give them more times to fix it. Um, okay. But um, maybe if the online, I mean, I'm guessing the people who are online now, probably for us, you can continue giving the lecture now if you want, and then give it again um, okay. in the access I, class I do, if you like. I do both. I, I, I finish now in 10 minutes and I repeat that story for the, uh, in, the, in the session problem. Yeah, I think so. I think that's probably best if that works for you and if everyone else is happy who's here yes, 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 completely agree. Give me one moment and I okay, turn. Thanks, Eric. I'm, I'm sorry about this. No, no, no problem. So I was over here, I think. We, ah, sorry, we, we were trying to review this over here. I think I can, can go on from here.
I don't know, uh, Emmanuel, sorry, I don't know what to do with the, the recording. Um, um, we'll cut it uh, afterwards. So Fedor is, is recording and okay. we'll just cut this fun bit in the middle. Okay, okay. So let's let's go on. Uh, up to now, we our, all our effort has produced the same correction that we have proposed in the beginning of the lecture to deform the Lorentz transformation. We have the same story, the same Green-Schwartz mechanism using this decomposition and the version of the row identification. Uh, but we have now a systematic procedure to deform the DFT action at least to to find the four derivative terms. That was uh, it was a very nice question for Camille. We, we can use this procedure to, to, to construct the four derivative terms in the heterotic double field theory. And the reason is that we uh, perform an, uh, an approximation over here. This approximation is related to four derivative terms. We, don't, we do not have the, the, the full story because we are, we are performing an approximation in this transformation. When we approximate this transformation to the leading order, this field over here, this C field, transforms in the same way as the generalized fluxes. So I think it's 1.30 in Santiago. I will finish uh, 1.40 in order to, to, to respect the time. So let's try to, to understand this systematic pro procedure at the level of the action. So the idea here is that we have an action in terms of the generalized fluxes from an ODD plus K point of view, this over here. And we can write these terms, for, uh, these are two derivative terms from an ODD plus K perspective, but we can perform the decomposition and the generalized version of the row identification in order to write uh, these, uh, these components or these projections in terms of the degrees of freedom of DFT, of the, of the standard ODD multiplets. And this field is going, and this field, the gauge field is going to, to, to disappear because we use the generalized version of the row identification. And at the end of the day, we recover this, these are these are the computations, but at the end of the day, we recover this action. Using this systematic procedure, we can obtain this action. This is a correction to the double field theory action. It's a, a four derivative correction, each, each flux contains one derivative. So we have one derivative over here, one over here, and these letters E are derivatives. So we have four derivatives over here, and we re and this action reproduces the version of the rule approach when we redefine the field line in a non-covariant way that is needed to connect the Green-Schwartz mechanism from double field theory to supergravity. It's a very nice action. That is a very nice computation, but it's a very long computation. I can't show you now that kind of computation, but you can try to follow our computations in this reference. It is a very nice computation. And the systematic procedure, this systematic procedure was used to construct this, this, this contribution that it's related to the A parameter, but we can easily adapt the construction to recover the R plus parameter, and the idea is to start cons uh, by considering this other group, the OD plus KD invariant theory. And then we have this gauge fixing over here with different projections. And finally, uh, considering, uh, considering an identification from this new C field with um, this, this other, um, these other projections of the fluxes, we can construct R plus in a very similar form to the R minus. The, under, the, the only difference is that we are changing the projection of our different fields, but the structure is exactly the same. And then we have the biparametric action principle. This is our biparametric action with four derivative terms. So this is the idea of the generalized version of the root identification. Here we can summarize all our, our story. We start from an ODD plus K formulation, then we perform an ODD decomposition to write the theory in terms of, of ODD multiplets. We constructed a map between the gauge degrees of freedom. This is the important part, the map between the gauge degrees of freedom uh, to the gravitational ones. And we are trying to mimic the verse of the row identification. And the idea is this, to, to have a gauge field with Lorentz indices and to identify this with a, the component of the fluxes and the same for the parameters. 
And using these uh, identifications, we obtain the generalized skin sharp mechanism and that's the important part. And we have a systematic procedure. So we have higher derivative bosonic corrections uh, to the heterotic double film theory. And this procedure can be implemented starting from an OD plus KD construction to obtain the full B parametric corrections uh, and to match with a version of the rule approach. So this is the idea. And in these last five minutes, I am going to tell you something about the extension to higher order formulations in terms that we want the six derivative terms, the eight derivative terms, we want the higher order corrections. So this for this procedure, just as I show you, this procedure cannot be extended to second order since the gauge field do not transform as a fluke projection. We have extra terms over here. We have this extra term. We have this extra term. We have a lot of extra terms and this identification is not valid anymore, but we can solve this problem in this way. If we identify the gauge group with the full, the, the right part of the extended Lorentz group from the very beginning, this identification works very well, at least to second order. That is what we, sh we show in, the, in, in, this, in this paper. I am going to, to give you the reference in, in some minutes, but we can perform this other identification. We, can, we need that the dimension of the gauge group to be infinity. So the, mathematic, the mathematical details are, are not very well studied. But this procedure, uh, it, again, this is like a heuristic, again, a heuristic argument to, to have a second order correction, but it, they, they work very nice, uh, at least from heuristic arguments. So the map is this one. This is a new map. It's different to the previous one, since I have, I, I have problems with my, with my pencil, sorry. Okay. We have a different map over here because we are identifying the gauge group with a full right Lorentz group. This means that we have an iterative procedure to consider. The iterative procedure is this one. We have an identification from this field over here, this A field with extend, extended indices with the fluxes. We have this kind of identification. So in some, in some sense, when we take the gauge field, we identify the gauge field with a flux that depends on the gauge field again. We have an iterative procedure. It's the, the, the idea is exactly the same. It's very similar. It's very, very similar. We have the same relations. And since the gauge group is infinity, perhaps these same relations, uh, perhaps they are well, but they, they deserve a better mathematical study. But we are trying to, we, we perform this identification, this generalized version of, this is the generalized version of the raw identification. We call the generalized version of the raw identification to this one, to the full order identification. So this identification, it's uh, quite similar from the, from the previous one. We have a, a minus sign over here, but it's a recursive procedure useful to construct higher order contributions where XR acts as a regulator. This is a, a very, a very nice uh, aspect of the, of the construction. And you can see all the details in this reference. This is the, the original paper. Um, I am based on this paper. But the idea is, is, is as follows. We will have a gauge field. You identify this with a, a generalized flux that depends again it uh, depends again on this, on this field and you identify it again and it depends again and it's an iterative procedure. This XR uh, gives exact results and it is likely that higher order corrections do not reproduce the full, the full story. We, we can reproduce infinite alpha prime corrections. We can reproduce six derivative terms derivative terms and so on but we are we are very sure that we are not reproducing all the terms of the string theory since the Riemann the quartic Riemann interactions contain terms proportional to this transcendent coefficient and this pro, uh, and with this procedure or with this method we cannot produce this kind of trans, transcendent transcendental coefficients so um, the, this story is not complete we 
uh, we, we do not have all the alpha prime corrections. This would be very nice because this is a kind of non-perturbative method in terms of, of, of alpha prime. This ODD plus K is like a non-perturbative method. And when we do the, the breaking, we are perturbing in alpha prime if, if you want. So the state of the art of the construction is the, uh, the state of the art of this topic is that this identification was done in, in this paper in 24. These references are related to my lecture notes. The extension of this procedure to bosonic double field theory or HSC theory was done in this other paper by Marquez and Baron. And the inclusion, 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 I don't know, of the SUSI degrees of freedom, uh, considering four derivative heterotic double field theory, the full story for the massless fields of the heterotic string theory was done in this, was done very recently in this, this paper. So most of the course was based in 24 uh, and this other paper. And in the latter, the generalized version of the row identification was performed in presence of fermionic degrees of freedom. And we have extra identifications, for example, relating the Gaishino field in, in, at the DFT level with the curvature of the gravitino and some kind of, of aspect. I am not going to review them, but you can read uh, this reference. Uh, this is the reference. And well, that, that's all. This is the, the end of the course. Uh, I, I am very grateful to all of my collaborators because some works covered in these lectures uh, uh, were, were it's work with them. I, I would like to, to thank all the organizers for this very nice school. Um, I, I have some, some thanks to, to, to people who who has helped me to, to construct the, the lectures or has uh, helped me to improve the lectures. And just, um, they, they are Sergi Guri, Nahuel Miron, Alejandro Rodriguez, Ricardo Borsato, and Emmanuel Malek. And um, finally, I have this funny picture over here that it's a kind of analogy between computing alpha prime corrections and scoring a goal. And this is just, uh, these are different methods to compute the same. Uh, on, the, on the left, we have an analogy to a scattering amplitudes or beta function computation that are really hard computations. And on the right, we have a, a kind of duality. This is like both uh, code keepers over here. It's like a kind of duality. It's, I, I know it's illegal to, to perform this kind of thing, but it, uh, it's funny for me at least to have this comparison between the methods. So uh, I hope you, 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 you think in double field theory as an easy way to construct these alpha prime corrections. So that, that's all. And um, thank you very much to, to all the people that it's listening to me. Uh, thanks a lot, Eric. Um, thanks for the lectures and thank you for um, also um, dealing with the technical problems we just had. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, thanks also to the participants for their patience uh, while we had these problems. Um, any final questions on what Eric asked? Obviously, there's also the opportunity later in the excess class to ask more detail, but um, yeah, are there any more questions we have now? Thanks, Camille. And thanks everybody for the participation. It was a, a, a pleasure to be here and talking about this topic. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, maybe I can just very briefly ask, um, so what's the status on these, uh, on the court agreement tensor? Any idea how to obtain it in some kind of modified DFT like, like this? Well, um, uh, let me see where, where is my state of art here? This is, the, I'm not, the state of art, this this theta three terms this theta these theta terms are very problematic because um, perhaps they are related with some abstraction in, in double field theory in the sense that perhaps ODDR is not enough to construct this kind of construction perhaps we need to, to think in in higher groups in order to to construct this kind of terms perhaps it's not possible to, to construct this from the double field theory. It, it, it's it's we need a, a very good discussion about this kind of, of arguments because uh, it, the, the story is very different when you compactify um, when you work in before compactification. So um, 
Uh, I, I don't really know how to solve this problem. It's a very interesting and open problem. Um, um, I am not sure if double field theory is enough. Um, they, they are very strong arguments to think that double field theory is not enough to, to reproduce them. But perhaps we can, but, but I, I, I don't really know. Uh, it's, it's a very good question and it's a, a huge open problem right now. Yeah, okay. Oh, I just want to see if maybe you have some more insight. I know this is obviously what a lot of people are working on at the moment or thinking about. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I just one last comment. Um, please. For this last point that you were dealing about the DFT and the alpha prime corrections, I think there is a paper by Linus Wolf and he's a student, right? Which yes, says yes, that yes. there is an obstruction. Uh, exactly. Do you know what will be the like a way out to that obstruction? Yes, that that obstruction was the reason. Uh, it's the reason why I was saying that perhaps it, DFT is not enough, and ODD, exactly. ODD comma ODDR symmetry perhaps is not enough to construct this kind this kind of terms. Um, that that that's that that's uh, the, the the huge argument. Um, but perhaps uh, we can construct this kind of correction from a bigger group, bigger from ODD. For example, in this lecture, in this last part, we were analyzing an ODD plus K formulation, and we went and we go from ODD plus K to, to ODD. In some case, ODD plus K is bigger than ODD. Um, perhaps we can perform that kind of identification and, and work with a bigger group to, to ODD plus K um, in order to avoid this problem. But it's it's. A, a, for now, it's it's a, a, a very big open problem. But in here, if I got the point, is like ODD plus K is not going to solve that, or there are what's the obstruction? That's the thing that I did. Right, remember. right, right. ODD plus K is not, in, not enough. That's why here uh, I write okay. do not reproduce, do not reproduce the full story. This means that from ODD plus K to ODD, we obtain four derivative terms, six derivative terms, eight derivative terms. But when we analyze the eight derivative terms, the term that contains this, this uh, coefficient is not going to appear using this ODD plus K formalism. Sure, that, you that can reproduce the, as much corrections as you want, but you are not sure you will match with the string theory, basically. Exactly, exactly. Okay. okay. Perhaps, so, perhaps, yeah. perhaps there are methods in order to perform non-covariant field redefinitions and that kind of stuff, but uh, I'm not sure if we can make appear this kind of, of coefficients from field redefinitions. Uh, I think it's, it's not possible, but of course, uh, it's just a guess. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, oh, Maybe I can also just add a brief comment. I mean, these are the sort of corrections that would also appear in type two at lowest order, right? Exactly. So in some sense, it's good that this doesn't come from ODD plus K because, because there's no way to do ODD plus K and the exceptional theories. So yes. if there's some enlargement, maybe one should look for an enlargement that one can also use for the EDD cases. But yes, uh, I mean, that's obviously now just wild speculation. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. Perhaps uh, working with these exceptional groups could be uh, performing some identifications in that kind of cases. If we could relate some, the, the point here is that these theta three terms are in the type two, but are also in the heterotic string. So that that's that's a little problematic. But uh, I agree that perhaps these uh, the exceptional groups will be more useful in order to construct these kind of corrections. Uh, there, there is another problem that the computations, when you leave the four derivative terms, when you go to second order, the computations are really, really hard. Uh, even in the four derivative case, the computations sometimes are very hard. It depends, perhaps it depends on your computer because you can use some software, but even the, the, the software uh, is, is, uh, is not enough, even with, with, I don't know, Cadabra software or something like that. It's it's very difficult. It's very uh, the, the the programs take a lot of time to converge to a result. It's uh, this this kind of chokes are very good chokes to four derivative terms. But at six derivative terms, DFT is very very complicated. Uh, um, uh, uh, and perhaps beta function computation and scattering amplitude is impossible. I don't know. Uh, that's why we know terms up to eight derivative terms. Are, 
and that's all. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Eric. Um, maybe at this point it's a good place to stop because um, also I'm sure everyone's getting hungry, depend irrespective of the time zone. Um, yes, yes. So thanks a lot, Eric, and uh, we'll see you for the exercise classes where, of course, people have more opportunity Perfect. to ask. And uh, yeah, um, thank you very much. And you've got a round of applause from Santiago as well. Uh, Saskia was writing. So uh, yeah, see you soon.